So the very first thing that we need to talk about and that really sort of starts off um, all statistics is the difference between populations and samples. Um, I'm sure a number of you guys probably know this from undergrad if you've done stats as an undergrad. Population is just an entire collection of relevant people or events. You can define a population however you want. Um, importantly, it's just that it includes every single aspect of it, every single example of it. So, for example, you could have everyone in the United States, everyone in this class, everyone with some sort of specific disorder. It doesn't really matter. Um, all that matters in terms of how you define the population is what types of questions you want to ask or what your theory says or something along those lines. Um, parameters are measures of populations. And I have Greek in parentheses there because parameters are usually represented with Greek variables. So if you see a variable in Greek, it's a parameter, meaning it's representing something about a population. If you see it in the Roman alphabet and our alphabet, it's representing a sample. Okay, so that's one way to help distinguish those and help keep them straight. And that's standard throughout the field. There's not a whole lot of standard notation in statistics. This is one thing that's fairly standard, is that parameters are going to be in Greek. And when I say measures of populations, basically what I mean there is just, it's a way of sort of summarizing the data. For example, the mean of a population, the standard deviation of a population, what's the modal response, stuff like that. Um, a sample is just some subset of an entire collection. Right? It's just some subset of your population. Um, and this is really, really important because understanding whether you're working with populations or samples really dictates what you're going to be doing. For example, you would never need inferential statistics for population. Yeah, I shouldn't say never, but there's not a single example I could think of where you would need inferential statistics. And we're going to get into that, but it's just fine to use the descriptives and say, here's the mean of the population. These two populations are different or aren't different. Um, inferentials are for when you're jumping from a sample to a population. We're going to get into that here a little bit more. Um, samples would be something like some Americans rather than everyone, one class out of an entire high school, some people with a disorder. Pretty clear, right? Okay. Um, yeah, I know this is basic. I just want to make sure everyone's on the same page. Yeah. Sorry, can you explain the difference between everyone in the class over the population and then one class in high school? Sure. It, de it depends on how you define your population. So if you're, if you're interested in how people in this class do, how are you going to do on your final, that would be the entire population. If you're interested in how well do people in this whole high school do compared to other high schools, but you only looked at one class, that would be a sample. So yeah, and it always depends on how you define it. It's not, there's not some sort of population that exists in the world. It's based on how you sort of cluster things together. Um, so statistics are measures calculated from samples. So parameters and statistics are basically the same thing. I mean, statistics encompasses a lot more. But the technical term statistics, if someone refers to a statistic, they're talking about something that came out of a sample as opposed to a parameter. So the mean of a population, the average IQ of all Americans, is a parameter. The mean of a sample, the average IQ of just the people in this room out of all Americans, is a statistic. Does that make sense? And you can always tell in the notation because they use Roman letters, which is our is that clear? Again, I know this is kind of basic, but it's going to be helpful because here's where we're going to go. So here's a broad overview of what you do in social science research in general. Um, basically, you have some population up here, the big circle. But typically in social science research, you can't measure the whole population. You can't go right now and get IQs, IQ scores for all American citizens, <coughs> mainly because people are going to be being born, people are going to die. It would be impossible, not to mention incredibly expensive, right? So just practical limitations. Usually what we do is you apply some sort of a sampling technique to draw out some subset of that population. There's different ways you can do this. For example, polls try and get representative samples. They try and make sure that they have each group well represented in the subset from the population. Um, usually as researchers when we're sampling, we try and do random sampling <coughs> so that you're not introducing any bias. You're not picking some weird subset of the population. You're picking something that sort of represents um, what it is. You take your sample, you characterize it using statistics, you get the mean, standard deviations, you get some sense of what these samples look like. It's all you can really measure. And then you use your, your sample and statistics to draw inferences, make estimates, and more or less what you <coughs> generally want to know about is the population. And you use statistics to get there from a sample. Does that make sense? So if we could just get the whole population, we wouldn't have to know all the statistics stuff that we're going to go through. You could just talk about the population and describe it. Say, here's what the population looks like. Here's what's happening. However, because we generally can't do that, we have to use a sample. And then all this complicated stuff that comes around here on the bottom is all the stuff we're going to talk about today. 
inferential statistics, basically how do you make claims about populations when all you can look at is samples. Does that make sense? Sort of broad overview of what we do. Um, Again, sort of just laying basic groundwork here. There's two types of variables. You've got independent variables. Um, independent variables are the variable that is manipulated experimentally or pseudo-experimentally. Um, in the first case, experimentally, you could give someone a drug versus a placebo. That would be an independent variable. Or pseudo-experimentally, you could look at gender. Obviously, you can't randomly assign people to different genders. That's already a class that exists in the world. So that would be a pseudo-experimental independent variable. So you can't manipulate it yourself. But the basic idea here is these are the things that are differentiating things and the way you break groups up and what you're manipulating when you're doing experiments. Dependent variable, um, often called the outcome variable, is the variable that you're measuring to observe whatever hypothesized effect it is that you're using. <coughs> Test scores, anxiety levels, happiness, you name it. These are all going to be dependent variables. Um, there you go. I just, I guess I jumped in on that one. Again, makes sense. I think you guys are all pretty familiar with this stuff. Um, Okay, types of measurement. So this is actually a part that I've noticed um, from tutoring that in undergrad statistics is often sort of not emphasized enough, I guess I would say. They mention it in undergrad statistics, but it's actually incredibly important in research design and in methodology. And the main reason this is so important is because how you measure something impacts what kind of analysis you can do. So if I ask you, do you like this, and I let you answer on a yes or no scale, you're not going to be able to run the same kinds of statistics that you could if I asked you how much do you like this and let you answer on a 1 to 7 scale. So this is sort of the first thing, the first level that you want to hit statistics at is what level am I measuring my variables at. And if you're involved in research design, you want to think about this before you run the research. I've gotten data sets before where they didn't think about this before they ran the research and they're incredibly difficult to analyze. It's clunky, it's not pretty, you just this is really important and you need to think about it before you actually run your research. Um, oh, by the way, these, these variables are all hierarchical. So any variable, the next one down, <coughs> could be basically represented as the one that came before it. It could include it, but the reverse isn't true. So for example, I could make that 1 to 7 scale variable the same as a yes, no. Just break it in the middle and say, oh, there's two groups. There's the yes group and the no group. But I couldn't go the other way. I couldn't take the yes, no variable and make it on a 1 to 7 scale. Does that make sense? So the first type is nominal variables, uh, where nominal means name, right? Comes from the root name. Um, and these are just basically variables that are measured as categories, right? So ethnicity, gender, location, yes, no responses, um, all these would be nominal variables. The next level up, you've got ordinal variables. Now, ordinal variables are ranked variables. Um, they're variables that can be ranked in some meaningful way. But importantly, what differentiates these from the next two types that we're going to talk about is that the gaps between the values are uneven. Let me illustrate a little bit what I mean by that, and then we'll come back to it here as we get to the next um, types of measurement. Um, imagine you have a race, and you have first place finishes in two hours, second place finishes in two hours and 10 minutes, and third place finishes two hours, 10 minutes, and two seconds. <coughs> right? So first was way out in front of second and third. An ordinal variable, you would just know first, second, and third. Even though second and third are almost the same, yet first is very different. Right? Does that make sense? That's what defines an ordinal variable. So if you want to know if it's ordinal or if it's higher, you just need to ask, are the gaps between the, the different values, are they all going to be even? Right? Does that make sense? OK. Samples of this would be ranking in a race. Also class rank, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, you could think of as a, as a ranked variable. Um, and this is really important to have these two on one slide and have the other two on the other slide. Because if these are the only types of variables that you have, you have to use non-parametric tests, which again, some of you are probably familiar with. We're going to come back to that here later in the slides. But non-parametric tests are awesome in some ways. They can do all kinds of wonderful things, but you lose a lot of statistical power, which means if you're doing research, you have to increase the number of subjects that you're using. Right? Does that make sense? So you sort of want to avoid these guys. That's not, you know, that's a rough and dirty sort of synopsis, but you more or less want to avoid these guys in your dependent variables. We're going to come back to that. If, they're, if your independent variables are nominal, gender, or whatever, that's totally fine. If your dependent variables are nominal, it sort of boxes you in a corner in, types of what, in terms of what types of statistics you can actually do on your data. How is it? Too fast? Too slow? Good? Cool. OK, so types of measurement. These are the variables you like. These are what you want your dependent variables to be measured on. Um, 
First is an interval scale. And these are just variables measured numerically where the distance between the points is equal. In the social sciences, for the most part, this is the highest level that our variables get to. So in general, you don't have to think about the next one. Interval is sort of the highest level. It doesn't really matter the next one. Um, I introduce it just because it's sort of textbook to introduce it. And it, there, there is one important difference. For the most part, just think about interval variables um, as what you want for your dependent variable. These would include things like seven point scales, how much you like something on a scale of one to seven. Um, we sort of assume that it's interval, right? Clearly it may not be, but that's an assumption that we generally make. Um, Fahrenheit temperatures, for example, difference between two degrees and three degrees is the same as difference between three degrees and four degrees. Um, and the next type is called ratio scale. These are basically, they're the same thing as an interval variable, but they have a meaningful zero point. Meaning that a zero on, on whatever it is that you're measuring has some meaning that's not arbitrary. Right, like on a seven point scale, you could imagine you could go like zero to six. In zero, it's not really meaningful, right? When someone's like, oh, I'm not really interested in it, right? Or I think that's really bad. There's nothing sort of anchoring that into the world in a meaningful way. Does that make sense when I say that? Good example, oh, the reason it's important is because the ratio scale, it allows statements like subject A did twice as well as subject B. So for example, if you're answering how much you like something on a one to seven scale, and let's say I like it and I rate it a two and you rate it a four, it's not really meaningful to say you like it twice as much as me. Right, that sounds kind of silly if you think about it. Um, but with ratio scale variables, you actually can say that. Good examples of this would be GPA, right? If I get a 4.0 and you get a 2.0, in some sense you could say my GPA is twice your GPA. Because there's a meaningful zero point, that means you just failed that entirely, <laughs> right? Another good example, and this is sort of subtle, is Kelvin temperature. So I don't know how much you guys know about scales of temperature. Fahrenheit temperature, zero is just the freezing point of water. That's just an arbitrary set point, right? So when they invented it, they just said, or I'm sorry, freezing point of water is 32, I'm looking at Celsius. But they just basically arbitrarily set that somewhere, right? However, with Kelvin temperature, it's actually defined in terms of molecular energy. And zero on a Kelvin scale is when all molecular movement stops. So that has a very sort of rich meaning in the physical world. So on the Kelvin scale, you could say something that's four degrees Kelvin is twice as warm as something as two degrees Kelvin because there's twice as much molecular motion. I think it doesn't quite break down like that, but roughly that conveys the idea, I think. Is that clear? Does that make sense? Again, in general, in social science, you can just sort of collapse these. We don't usually make claims like they did twice as well, right? Um, and also the, the statistics are the same for them in general. Most importantly, you want to measure your dependent variable on one of these levels because then you can do parametric statistics. We're going to get into parametric statistics. That's the majority of what we're going to be talking about. Um, parametric statistics are sort of the standard for social science. T-tests, Z-tests, ANOVAs, all of these, they're parametrics. They're very powerful. They're very good. Um, but it's really important to think about this because if you don't measure your, your dependent variable on one of these levels, you can't run parametrics. You're stuck only with non-parametrics. However, the reverse isn't true. If you wanted to run non-parametrics with these variables, you could convert them into the other ones. You would just lose some information. You wouldn't generally want to do that, but you could. Make sense? 